for more insight on the quake and the level of preparedness around the, uh, the Pacific, let's speak with Robert J. Geller, Professor Emeritus at the University of Tokyo. Professor, thank you so much for joining us uh, on the show. So how would you rate the overall multi-nation response, particularly, I guess, in the areas of coordination and, you know, quick information sharing? Well, I, I think everything worked pretty well. The information um, got out to the various countries, and then um, they issued proper warnings to their citizens. So um, everything appears to have worked very well. But I'll sound the cautionary note that the tsunami wasn't really big enough to cause serious damage. It was only maybe one meter, for example, in Japan as compared to maybe 14 or 15 meters in 2011. So um, it was not a severe test, but everything appeared to be handled satisfactorily. Professor, it's been less than 24 hours since the quake struck. Uh, would you say the worst is over? I mean, reports say there have already been more than 100 significant aftershocks recorded near Russia. Uh, some tsunami alerts remain in place in a few areas. What can we expect in the hours and the days to come? Well, for, for the rest of the world, other than Russia, pretty much everything is over. Um, the, the aftershocks in Russia will not be a problem to the rest of the world. For, for the people in Russia, um, the aftershocks might be a big problem. For example, if a building was already damaged by the main shock, then the aftershocks might be able to um, destroy it. So the local people um, in the earthquake area should be cautious. Professor, I mean, going back to the point you were making about how, you know, the waves that were generated this time compared to 2011 uh, were relatively small. I I'm just wondering, given the magnitude 8.8 .8, and the relatively shallow depth of 21 kilometers, why didn't we see the kind of waves that were generated at uh, during Tohoku, where the readings were quite close? They were about nine magnitude and actually a little bit deeper, 30 kilometers. Okay, well, um First of all, I, I was talking about the, the tsunami size in Japan. The, the tsunami in Russia was considerably higher. I, I don't know the exact number, but maybe five meters or even higher. So as you get farther away from the earthquake source, then the tsunami waves are much, much smaller. Now, the other thing, you were you're just talking about the depth at which the earthquake started. Here, here in Japan, there was very large, shallow slip on faults very near the surface. So that, that's why the tsunami was so big in Japan. That, that may not have been the case in Russia. Uh, I know this is a question that's often asked when a quake strikes, but could this have been predicted, Professor? And if not, why? What are the biggest challenges in determining when an earthquake could strike? Well, an earthquake of this general um, size and location can, can be forecast on a very long-term basis. For example, we know, let's say every 150 or every 200 years, on average, throughout geological time, you have an earthquake like that. But it's completely impossible to predict an earthquake immediately in advance. There, there's no... Um, mathematical or physical theory allowing you to do that. And there, there are no obvious warning signs. W warning signs. There are small earthquakes all the time. And we can't say which one of them will grow to a big earthquake until everything has ended. Um, I know people expect a lot from science, but there, there are many things science cannot do. And this is one of them. Professor, um, as it stands, you were saying that we, we have been lucky so far. No reports of deaths or major damage reported. 
But we know, also know that millions responded. They evacuated. They, you know, left for higher ground. And some right now would no doubt be asking, you know, was that really necessary? Maybe I'm not going to respond the same way, you know, the next time there's a warning. I mean, the question I have now is how crucial is it at this time to counter any form of complacency creeping in and to make sure that the response we had, you know, in the past 24 hours is something that is, you know, consistent and is repeated? Should there be further tsunami alerts coming? Well, um, this, this was a magnitude 8.7 or 8.8 .8 earthquake. And it's maybe, um, it's the biggest earthquake in 14 years since the Tohoku earthquake. So in other cases of distant earthquakes, triggering tsunamis. For example, in 1946, you had over 100 people dying in Hawaii um, from an earthquake in South America. And you also had maybe 100 people dying in Japan. So I don't think if you order an evacuation as a precaution once every 20 years or so, I think people will have to be happy to comply. If this happened every week, maybe people would get tired of it. But I think once in every 10 or 20 years, where, where there is a possibility for people dying in significant numbers, people will be happy to comply. I hope, anyway. All right, understood, Professor. We have to leave you there. Thank you so much for talking to us on Asia First this morning. Robert J. Geller is Professor Emeritus at the University of Tokyo.